Hi, folks. Uh, I'm Jeff Edgers, the Washington Post National Arts Reporter. And uh, welcome. Good morning. And we have a treat for you today. We have uh, Deborah Rutter, the uh, president of the John F. Kennedy Center for Performing Arts. We're going to talk about uh, this recovery and this very important section of the recovery in culture and arts. And uh, Deborah, thank you so much for joining us. Hey, Jeff. It's great to be with you. So, um, uh, and it is a steamy, steamy morning, but uh, I'm thinking about, um, uh, you know, to start out, we've all had this moment where we've realized, hey, things are actually uh, sort of on the way back. Uh, I don't know how you term that. Um, you know, you had performances in the Kennedy Center uh, in the fall. You had this amazing moment where you brought in uh, Renee Fleming and Vanessa Williams. But you also had 42 people in the audience. Uh, so mm -hmm. I don't know if that's where that moment comes. When have you felt like, hey, we're actually, we're, we're on the way back here and things are going to be better? Uh, a great question. Um, indeed, that moment on September 26 was really exciting, if I may, uh, just because there had been so much anticipation about what and when we'd actually be able to come back and be in business. Um, but there are 42 people and about 10 other, maybe eight, nine, 10 other people on either on stage or filming meant that it was very small, very limited. We've had a handful of other programs in the concert hall uh, and on stage and even out on the River Pavilion. Really beautiful, uh, great programming, small audiences. I would say that the Kennedy Center Honors was the moment when it felt like we really could be coming back live. We had about 250 people, um, and, but there was a sense of oh, maybe, maybe it's just around the corner. Now the Kennedy Center Honors, um, just a very, I think we have some, some, uh, some tape, they call it tape anymore, uh, but we have some, uh, some, a sense of what you did for the Kennedy Center Honors, which really reinvented this, uh, what we're used to seeing, which is in a theater normally with a huge audience and people coming onto a stage and you took it, you're on the plaza, you're on the roof, uh, you're doing all sorts of different things. Um, tell me a little bit about how you went about reinventing that. And then also, does this like, do you do this next year in this way, or do you go back to the way you used to do things? Well, first of all, as you know, we'll never go back to doing anything exactly the same way we did it before. Uh, that these shots uh, inside the opera house um, remind us that we've had a 42 year tradition of having one evening with a big celebration in that big opera house. Um, we were determined to go forward with honors because A, it's important to our country, to our honorees, to our artists. And we really felt like this was going to be an important moment to demonstrate the resilience of the Kennedy Center and the importance, frankly, of the Kennedy Center, not just here in DC, but throughout the country. So we determined back in December that we were gonna do it no matter what. We had no idea exactly what it could be like, but I'd seen enough shows that were done virtually taped and then sort of a push together created in some way or another. And so we said, okay, we're gonna go with a hybrid. Don't know what a hybrid really means when we decided that in December last year, but as the months, the weeks, the months, the days progressed, we sort of figured out that we could do a couple of live experiences for our patrons to come and see performances. And if that had to be only 50 people, it'd be only 50 people. It ended up being closer to 250. And that we would then tape things from around the country, really around the world, and uh, pull them together uh, with some live filmed activity here and some that you just saw that was shot across the center. And I'm, I'm just so proud of how we were really able to show the whole center uh, to our audience. Um, that part is gonna be harder to, to recreate, honestly, because the, the Kennedy Center is a really busy place. 
you know, it's kind of lovely having your own private performing arts center for those of us who come into the building on a regular basis, but it's not what we normally do. We, we average 2000 performances a year, which means every single night we have four, five, six performances. So to be able to film anywhere on campus at any time, and we moved it all during that week, is not gonna be really possible. But the idea that you could film things in other places and then for the show on television, actually having a different form of the tribute, that could happen. And ways in which the artists could engage directly with the individuals who are paying tribute to them, that was also very special. So let's, um, uh, you just mentioned all this activity, but we're, we're gonna flip back to March of uh, 2020 because that's when everything comes to a grinding halt. Um, and, uh, you know, you basically have to shut down. And at that point, you, you, the Kennedy Center is, uh, is given, I guess, $25 million through the CARES Act. Um, my colleague Peggy McGlone wrote about this very extensively. Um, and you're trying to deal with all these questions on the fly. Tell me what happens in March of 2020 from where your, your perspective is. Well, um, as the city and the country was closing down, we had really no idea, is this a six week venture? Is this a 16 week venture? We had no idea that it would become uh, ultimately an 18 month uh, shutdown, more or less. Um, because if you think from March of 20 to September of 21, so initially it was about conserving and understanding what the immediate needs were. It's sort of like a ship, you know, you don't wanna just bail water out of the ship. You wanna figure out how to preserve the ship so that it can continue to, to move forward. The CARES Act money came in and was an important lifeline for cash. And that $25 million was used actually literally for cash through the fiscal year and into the early fall. So those dollars um, that came through an appropriation and it was really the only way that we could be receiving it. As a federal entity, we actually couldn't receive any PPP and in the months following, we haven't been able to receive any of the other sources of revenue uh, that so many other arts organizations across the country have been able to access. No PPP, no shuttered venues, no local statewide funding can come to the Kennedy Center. So we are a unique uh, uh, business model. We're a federal entity, but we operate as a 501c3 uh, um, in terms of delivering on all of our programs. So uh, it has been really challenging, cash flow management, um, uh, making really critical decisions about what kinds of investments we can make. Um, our operating budget is annually about 230 to $250 million a year, and it will be under $100 million for this fiscal year. And, you know, given the, the lack of earned revenue, um, uh, we will probably end up with something between 10 and $15 million shortfall in this year. The 25 helped us last year, but we have nine months of 2021 that has been really challenging for us. Well, let's, um, uh, so, you know, we live in a political world, we know that. Uh, when that first, when the, when the CARES Act money came through, first you get attacked by some folks for, oh, why are we giving money to the arts? It's, there's so much, many more important issues. We hear that all the time. But uh, about a week later, uh, the National Symphony Orchestra gets notified by uh, by you and by management that they are being furloughed, and that you know heightens the public relations disaster really at that moment because people then say, how can they get twenty five million dollars and then furlough all those musicians? So tell me what's happening at that point and why that happened. And in the end, it sort of walked back, but explain what what we're seeing in the moment there. So, uh, you know, cash is king. Let's be really clear. It takes money to be able to meet payroll and to support all of our, uh, um, uh, and, and to support all of our expenses, whether those are our people expenses or our operating expenses. 
We did uh, have to furlough uh, quite a number of our administrative staff as well. The the orchestra, when we had made that proposal, it was at the same time that we were looking at it being for a six week period of time because we expected all, everybody to be coming back to work at the beginning of the, the summer period of time. I think it was even May 15 that we thought everybody would be back to work. So there was no intention for us to be uh, laying people off and furloughing people for an extended period of time. As it happens, uh, the musicians have received uh, essentially 75% of their salary throughout this period of time. Uh, the There are members of my staff who have are still at also 75%. There are uh, in individuals who have been furloughed from the Kennedy Center, and there are people who were laid off altogether. Uh, we are a much smaller organization, but it is not just the musicians who have been impacted. In 2019, we actually offered employment to nearly 5,000 individuals, either through W-2 or 1099 employment. And in 2021, at this point, we are under 1,000 we are probably closer to about 800, as a matter of fact. Our uh, musicians, uh, for which there are about 160, are uh, still employed uh, at 75% of their normal salary. We have only about 250 administrative staff, down from about 400. And then we have all of the other artists and performers, ushers, uh, theater manager, stage crew, all of the backstage, all of the artists who perform on our, our stages who are uh, have not received compensation. And it's because we haven't been able to uh, do any work, frankly. Uh, the National Symphony Orchestra has been very creative about the way the musicians have done a variety of other types of work. We've recorded a handful of concerts for digital broadcast. We've had a few live concerts and they're going to be out at Wolf Trap now, which is really great. But the, the volume of work that we have uh, actually been able to present is so much smaller. I think we are in the neighborhood of two or three dozen versus 2000 a year ago. So nobody should be really thinking that this is great, it's all coming back. I mean, the biggest lesson I think we have learned through this period of time, not just the Kennedy Center, but all arts organizations, is there is no safety net for artists and the creative workforce. There is uh, insufficient policy that supports these workers who work, uh, who have regular work when you have performing arts organizations and venues open to perform, but when you don't, these people uh, in, uh, across the board have lost uh, income, benefits, housing, identity. This is really probably the biggest issue that has had some attention, but I think really deserves a lot more attention. There, there's been so much energy put towards how do we support the individuals who have lost jobs, but they haven't talked about the ones like the artist who make such a difference in our world and just don't have that kind of a safety net. Um, Deborah, I just wanna go back just a little tiny bit to this, um, the timing of furloughs and the uh, CARES Act money. Uh, in that moment of time, uh, because it, it looks like you, you made a decision to change that. And I know this is hard because you're supposed to be an advocate for the arts, but you're also running a business and a challenging business. Um, so at that moment, when you knew that the furloughs were coming, did you think, boy, we're gonna get hammered here and we need to rethink this, or is there a negotiation going on behind the scenes that we don't understand that uh, with, with the symphony to try to figure out a way to pay them some portion without these performances? Tell us what's going on there. Well, there are always negotiations going on and conversations that are taking place that are not in public. Uh, but uh, what's really interesting is fully understanding that uh, the the visibility on the CARES Act funding, when it came through, I thought, you know, this is going to be tough. I, 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 I sensed it. I looked at my family and I said, this is not going to be the easiest thing. We need it. We need it desperately. 
if I had been able to receive significantly more, uh, then I probably would have been able to keep uh, employees uh, more full, fulsome. Um, we didn't know. We were trying to do our best for projecting what the long-term cash needs were going to be. And uh, believe me, I spend hours every week still looking at cash flow through this year and into the next because of we are still in a, def a, a deficit situation. You need to understand that our business model is pretty unique in that we have an orchestra and an opera company, both of which have uh, a, one type of a business model, which is more dependent on contributions. And then the rest of our organization, which is a, a presenting as well as producing organization that has very high earned revenue, ticket sales. And when all of those disappear, the cash that keeps both the opera, the orchestra and the Kennedy Center going disappears completely because you have to be able to refund tickets to our, our patrons. Now, some of them actually contributed them back, but a lot of them went right back to the individual who had the ticket, appropriately so. So our business model, which is quite often really strong compared to other uh, art forms, uh, in this case was really challenging because I knew that I needed to have cash to be able to refund back to our patrons. So negotiations were taking place on multiple levels, us trying to understand cash flow very significantly, uh, the sort of the primary issue, and making very tough, tough decisions for, uh, you know, ones that impact people's lives. There's no question about it. Um, and I think the undercapitalization of arts organizations and the fragile business model of of uh, not just the Kennedy Center, but so many arts organizations across the uh, across the country, we're in this tough, really awkward situation. We have a congressional mandate to be the national cultural center, and yet we don't get money for that programmatic aspect of our identity. We get money from the federal government to support the physical structure, the building itself. That's great. And they're very generous, and we have done a really, really fine job stewarding the physical plant here. But our our mission to be the National Cultural Center is the one that was challenged uh, throughout this period of time. And you know, the National Symphony Orchestra was the visible piece, perhaps, in that period of time. But there are artists who, and there are individuals across this institution who have suffered over these last 18 months. So, um, you know, obviously everybody talked about this as uh, last year got rolling and you were you were closed down. This whole idea of these exploding online programs and, you know, we saw, uh, you know, Yo-Yo Ma performing, uh, you know, in his, uh, over Zooms and I mean, incredible things, but things that not necessarily were tied to revenue. Uh, I don't think anybody figured out how to really make real money off of these online events. Um, mm -mm. So tell me, uh, we have some viewer mail from Jana Shea from Connecticut. She wanted to know if you're uh, going to continue offering streaming content even after the pandemic's over. So first, tell me about uh, what you think really uh, you know, stuck that you said, oh, I'm glad we came up with this under these you know, circumstances. and and what will you continue to offer streaming wise? We were really lucky because uh, we have been streaming our uh, Millennium Stage every day since 1997. So we have a multimedia team and it grew and it had lots of creative uh, new output during this period of time. You're absolutely right. Streaming is not a revenue source. Uh, everybody thought it might be and it, we were all kind of disappointed. But what we were not disappointed about was the innovation that took place. We were able to share programs uh, around the world uh, of main stage activity that we hadn't really done before. We were able to transform a lot of our education materials that have always lived in our digital learning sphere, but we've done virtual field trips with plays. We did the lunchtime doodles with Mo Willems every single day. Uh, we have been able to engage 
uh, in a, a much higher level of quality of program and, 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 and sort of touch point with patrons. What we've found is that our traditional patrons participated some, but not at the high volume that we would expect given the way in which they engage with us in the live performance experience. But what we have been able to do is reach new and younger audiences who came in to sample, to explore, to find out what was going on. And that has been really positive. So I believe that the education activities where we have been able to reach teachers and families and students in a, a, a much greater way directly through digital um, will continue. I think that there will be a, a level of engagement that we will capture from around the world and share and engage with, with our patrons. Um, and I think that there will be uh, an, in, uh, an increased way of doing this in a, not just a point and shoot kind of system of here, here's a show, let's show you what's going on at the Kennedy Center, but really to give you the fulsome experience of behind the scenes, you know, what it's like on the stage, looking out into the audience and the audience's, as well as the audience's perspective. It is not a revenue source. It's definitely uh, augmenting though. Uh, and it drives people to the live experience, I think. So, um, you know, one thing I wanted, I've been wanting to ask you for like 16 months, uh, it's when we got a nice private moment like this, is, um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, so, President Trump, who is no longer in office, but as we know, he, he made it uh, sort of an issue to uh, remain outside of some of the normal, uh, you know, events that, that a president would take part in. I mean, whatever your politics, it's wonderful to have the, the leader of the free world coming in to see your performances. So he didn't go to the Kennedy Center Honors, um, really did not, was not a present. I'd be curious. Deborah, did you at any point, do you call the president? I don't know if you have a cell phone number. Do you uh, reach out to the White House? Do you say, hey, you know what? Let's, let's do this because this is not political. We, uh, it, but it would be wonderful to have uh, President Trump and Melania here uh, to mm -hmm. see, what, uh, see what we do. Uh, so absolutely. Um, no, not on the cell phone number, but I know people who do. Uh, and uh, certainly our board chair, David uh, Rubenstein, had quite a number of conversations with him, both by phone and at the White House, and spoke to him about it. And I had a very good relationship with uh, the the team at the White House, a lot of communication, exploring ways to to engage the White House at the center. And uh, the first lady came uh, a handful of times to the Kennedy Center, and we had quite a number of uh, interactions. She was here particularly to support our program for VSA, and we had an international um, artist with disabilities competition, and she came as a part of the final performance and the award ceremony, and she came for the opening of the reach. Uh, we did have regular conversations to see how they might be able to be involved. Um, and of course, you know, the, 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 the Kennedy Center it really is uh, nonpartisan. Uh, we have really fine relationships with both sides. Uh, the funding that comes to the Kennedy Center is always embraced by both sides. The, the, the CARES Act funding actually was initiated by the Republican uh, team who are, deal with appropriations, uh, they know the value and the importance of the arts. Okay. Um, you know, we're all looking at what, I mean, I don't know if you do it, but I walk into the supermarket, I don't know, am I supposed to wear a mask? Am I not? I just follow the orders because I want to respect uh, the people working there. What can we expect to see in the fall at the Kennedy Center? Will, uh, are we going to see all the seats full? Are we going? Are people supposed to wear masks still? What, what do you envision? Well, of course, we're all learning day by day, and uh, the the social norms change day by day. Where we have established it today is that we invite everybody to be wearing a mask when they're in the theater, uh, when they are outside the theater in the large, high volume uh, out, uh, spaces of the lobby, and where you can social distance. 
you don't need to be wearing, uh, but as you enter and as you are inside the theater, we ask you to, to wear a mask because we are looking to have people sitting shoulder to shoulder. We had a, an event for the Washington National Opera just a couple of weeks ago, and I sat right next to, on either side with people, we were all wearing our mask for the performances. When we left to go to the reception, at the reception, we didn't wear masks. So inside the theaters, masks, still lots of uh, cleaning. The air ventilation, as it happens, at the Kennedy Center is extraordinary. So we have huge exchange of volume uh, in, with the air inside all of the theaters, in the lobby spaces. Those things are all really, really good and safe. The touch point cleaning will happen even though we know that that's not a point of transmission. Um, but we are looking at ways in which we can ensure that people not only feel safe, but are safe in our buildings. So we see, um, I mean, we see the Foo Fighters play a full Madison Square Garden in June. Uh, we're starting to see shows, go, you know, scheduled for Broadway. What, what, um, do you have a sense of when we say, hey, things are back to normal? I'm, I'm assuming it's not just the performers, it's also finding your audience and finding a way to make them feel comfortable. Well, I think the language needs to change. I don't know what, what's normal. I think we're going to have a new way of doing business and we're going to have a new sense of awareness. Um, uh, we are planning on uh, selling all of the tickets that we can possibly sell seat by seat arm, you know, shoulder to shoulder, uh, whether they are for free programs or uh, for ticketed events. And the first thing we'll do is September 10, and it will be a free program. And I sure hope there'll be 2,000 people in the concert hall. Um, I think that we will all be changing the way in which we do our work. We will be reconsidering um, how to make sure that we are safe, we will be reconsidering when and how we need to wear masks. Uh, we will be uh, thinking about the way in which we prepare for performances. So I don't know that, I don't know what's normal. Is there there's some definition somewhere that we know what normal is? It, I think we are forever changed. Yeah, I think for me, normal is just feeling like you're in a place and you can think about the thing you're watching or listening to and not be thinking necessarily about Am I safe? Uh, you know, yeah. is it hard to breathe? Uh, you know, things like that. Is there any effort to bring in? I just know my parents who are uh, uh, smart, uh, wonderful people who've been vaccinated. They're in their 70s. They love orchestras. They're still a little leery about being in a concert hall. Uh, but I'm seeing younger people who are like, oh, my, all set. Uh, now we can get back in there. Is there programming you bring in that's skewing a little younger because of this? Well, the that that's a really smart consideration. A couple of things first. One is that we have engaged with and consult with very regularly, like weekly, if not more than weekly, with Cleveland Clinic, and they have gotten to know the way we do our business, who we are, and we have had a, a dialogue with them to make sure that what we're doing is safe for absolutely everybody. Uh, that said, the the um, National Symphony Orchestra, our home team, is probably the one that will be the most busy just because they are here. They are in our employ. It'll be interesting to see how quickly the audiences come back for that. Um, those programs, we hope, will sell regularly and fully. Uh, the other programs that we have are around jazz, comedy, theater, those are all coming in uh, and ticket sales are going really well. I'm really heartened by the response that we've had from our audience. Well, I'm glad to hear that. Uh, Deborah, I could, you know that I could talk to you for hours about this stuff and uh, hopefully we will sometime soon and in person. Um, thank you so much for coming here. Good luck as you proceed in this recovery process. And uh, um, we're, we're, we're so glad to see that there's so much activity back at the Kennedy Center. I look forward to welcoming you back soon. Come in <laughs> September. Um, I'll be there. So, uh, and folks, uh, Washington Post Live uh, viewers at two o'clock, we'll have Laura Aratani is gonna be talking about uh, the future of flight. And uh, we are so grateful for your time and um, you know, have a great day, stay cool, and we'll see you soon.